Today we're starting on page 135 and we're going to read to 157. Polga is narrating first. Polga. We pull up to the shelter, a low building painted bright orange. A flash of Chico's face, glowing by the fire the night we burned my clothes, flickers in my mind. There are people sitting outside the shelter, a woman in a bright pink shirt near the doorway, staring out at the street and standing on one foot, who immediately reminds me of a flamingo. A man in a blue and white striped shirt is sitting on an overturned paint bucket. His eyes take us in as we get out of the taxi, but then his gaze goes back to the street when we walk up to the entrance. A priest in a long white robe spots us as we peer inside, nervous and unsure of where to go, what to do. He gestures for us to come in. Bienvenidos, he hosts, the priest says. Bienvenidos, I'll get in. The thing in my chest, my heart, stirs at the way he welcomes us, how he calls us he hosts. I stare at the blue walls that make me feel peace. I exhale a breath I think I've been holding since we left. Relief washes over me. I did it. I got us here. I blink away the tears in my eyes and tell myself not to get emotional. I look at Chico, who smiles his stupid smile and says, We made it. I shake my head at him, but I can't help smiling back as my heart flutters in my chest like it's grown wings. We didn't make it, not yet. We have so far to go, but we made it here, and that seems like something. The shelter smells like home, like coffee and warm tortillas and sugar and green chilies and onions and simmering beans. It smells like someone cares. I'm going to use the bathroom, Pequeño whispers to me, looking around. I nod and watch as she asks someone and then disappears. One of the women smiles at me, a flash of silver glinting from between two of her teeth. I watch as the boy younger than me, younger than Chico, holds his plate out to her. Sabes que? He a she asks him, speaking to him gently. When I make this food, I sing, and I pray to Papa Dios, so it will nourish your soul as well as your body. He smiles, and she spoons eggs and beans onto his plate. She places two tortillas on top and hands him a wrapped chocolate cupcake. My heart fills with the kind of emotion I've warned myself not to feel. It's dangerous to feel too much, whether it is hope or despair. I wish I could reach into my chest, wrap my hand around that pulsing thing, and calm it. Sit down, the priest says, gesturing to the long table in the center of the room. I'll be with you in just a moment. He goes back to talking to a man who has the look of a beaten dog to him. We sit down near the boy, who is by himself eating his food, and I stare at the man, at others who walk past us with the same expression. They don't look like people who have dreams. They look like people too tired, too scared to dream. I wonder how long before I look like that, too. Maybe I already do. In a far corner, there's a small television, but it is off. My eyes scan the wall where maps outlining different routes to the border hang alongside children's drawings, stick figures of families. Some of the figures have happy faces and others sad ones. Some of them have rainbows and some of them show stick figures falling on the ground. They're tiny eyes, tiny black X's. A calendar marks the days. Hola, a voice is suddenly next to us. My name is Padre Gilberto. When I open my eyes, the priest is there. A woman with glasses stands next to him with a clipboard in her hand, her gray hair pulled back in a frizzy ponytail. This is Marlena, the co-director who works at this shelter, the priest says, gesturing to the woman. Where are you coming from? Chico looks at me and I answer. Guatemala, I say quietly. The priest nods. You're headed to the United States? I nod. Well, Marlena will take you to answer some questions and get you settled in. Don't worry, Hios. You are safe for now. He reaches for my hand and holds it for a moment before letting go and doing the same with Chico. I hope God's grace will transfer to me in that touch. Keep me safe for more than just now. Come with me, Marlena says. Wait, there's one more, I tell her, looking around for Pequena, who just then is heading back to us. Marlena looks at Pequena and nods, leads us to a room with a small desk and two chairs. Everywhere there are boxes, some stuff with papers, others with random things like cereal and blankets and socks. She closes the door behind us, even though the room is stuffy and hot. She asks us our full names. When it's Pequena's turn to answer, she hesitates before giving her real name. Marlena looks over her glasses and nods, but she realizes Pequena is not a boy. Don't worry, she says. I understand. Marlena asks again where we are from and exactly why we're leaving. Chico and I tell her about Ray, and she listens intently, quietly. So it was you two who witnessed the murder? Not exactly, but yes. And then he pressured you to work for him, to be part of his gang? Chico and I nod, and she turns to Pequena. You too? Pequena hesitates. Why are you asking us this? You're not going to stop us from going on, right? No, it's a dangerous trip. It's an almost impossible trip. I won't stop you because I know you're running from worse, but I do have to make sure the shelter is, is as safe as possible. That crooks and criminals aren't coming here pretending to be migrants who then turn around and prey on real migrants. Some people do that, you know. They'll say, oh, come with me. I know someone who can help you. Or I know a way you can make some money. And then... 
Marlena shakes her head. Who knows with who or where you'll end up? Bueno, I know it sounds heartless, but I have to make sure you're really in need. But Kenya's eyes fill with tears and she wipes them away roughly before they can even flow down her cheeks. Our stories are real, she says, glaring at Marlena. But Kenya's face turns dark red as she tries to hold back tears, hold back her anger. I'm sorry, Marlena says, looking at Pequena carefully. I didn't mean... I'm running from the same guy, too, she spits out. Do you need me to tell you more than that? If Pequena's words are visible, they'd be black, tinged with red and orange like burning coals. When Pequena looks at Marlena, something passes between them that makes Marlena shake her head. No, that's enough, she says before going on to the next question. It hits me then, so suddenly, it feels like I've been struck. The truth is silver and white and flashes like lightning. It comes from somewhere, above, cracks into your brain, shoots down to your heart, zaps you. Ray. Pequena is running from Ray. Because that baby, that baby she didn't want, that she couldn't look at and could hardly stand to hold, that baby's Ray's. I look at her, but she won't meet my eyes. She's looking at her feet, wiping at tears I can't see, but I know we're there. Pequena, I whisper, but she shakes her head. Marlena directs more questions at me, and I answer. She explains the rules of staying at the shelter. A stay here is limited to no more than three days. Backpack searches are mandatory to ensure we are not carrying any weapons. I glance at Pequena, who puts her hand in her pocket. Men and women sleep in separate quarters unless there are no bunk beds left, and then it's the floor in a common room. Two meals are served a day, breakfast and dinner, and only at specific times. We're allowed one shower during our stay, and we must stand in line and wait our turn. Showers must be done one at a time, except for mothers helping their children. No belligerent behavior. No threatening or harassing other migrants. No alcohol. No drugs. Breaking any of these rules will get you kicked out and back on the streets. When Marlena is done, she looks at us and asks if we understand. Yes, we say in unison. Good, she says as she searches each of our backpacks. Then she walks us out to the dining area where she adds them to the shelf piled high with other backpacks. And past a volunteer who looks over them and makes sure that nobody takes anyone else's bag. And then, finally, she tells us that even though breakfast is over, we can still get some food if there's any left. The women who scrape the last of the breakfast food onto our plates look at us warmly, speak to us, look us in the eyes, tell us to eat. Chico stinks glances at Pequena as we sit down at the table, now empty except for us. We don't ask Pequena anything more about Ray. We eat our food in minutes. Around us, people play cards or talk quietly. Every now and then, there is laughter, and the sound of it is odd and out of place. The television is on now and plays loudly in the corner. A gossip show Mama used to watch, even though she said it was garbage, flashes on the screen. Television people in bright, crisp, expensive clothes. A woman sits inches from a television, staring at the faces of the made-up women, listening intently to stories of celebrities. We watch from the table, one show to another to another. We go outside and watch a few guys kicking a soccer ball. We watch people wash clothes by a cement sink outside. The hours pass. Marlena finds us before she leaves for the night and tells us we can shower tomorrow, that there are no more beds available, but there is another large room around back where we can sleep on the floor. We have no mats and the floors are concrete, but there's some blankets, she says. She hands them to us and shows us where the room is. They turn the lights off in an hour, she says. I think about asking Marlena for my backpack, for the Walkman I carry there with the tapes Mama gave me a few years ago, things that belong to my father that his sister had sent us. But I remember the promise I made to myself, that I would only listen once I got onto the train. Gracias, I tell Marlena, who is all business and efficiency, who gives us a small smile and nods, but her eyes flicker with compassion. Nos vemos mañana, she says. Buenas noches. And then she's gone, and there's only us, and the woman in the corner playing some kind of game with a teen girl and a toddler girl, another two women near her, an old man with a girl about Chico's age, and us. Chico, Pequena, and I settle down in the far corner of the room, opposite a wall with a huge mural of La Virgin. We watch as one of the women gets on her knees, inches over to La Virgin, bit by bit, her knees scraping against the concrete floor. I've heard of people traveling miles this way, over dirt road and pebbles and gravel on their knees, to appeal to the altar of a saint or a holy figure. It is a way of showing sacrifice, suffering, and respect, a way of making one worthy of their prayers being answered, as if her actions are a cue one by one the other migrants do the same. Even the old man who topples over and has to steady himself with his hands every few inches but does not give up until he's right in front of that mural. Chico looks at me and this is the and Chico looks at us and is the first of us three to follow. Then Pequena, then me. My jeans protect my skin, but the boniness of my knees makes them ache. I look over at Chico and Pequena at how close they are, how they close their eyes. Chico's face is scrunched up, and I can almost hear the pleading I imagine repeating in his head, please, please keep us safe. Pequena's face is stoic, almost expressionless, but her lips move ever so slightly. I try to pray, but all I can do is wonder why we have to hurt to be worthy of God's grace. 
And then I worry it's blasphemy. And then I worry I'll be damned. So I concentrate on the mural. How the colors seem to glow even in the space partly lit by a weak nightlight plugged into the room's only outlet. Red, like blood. Turquoise, like the water in Rio Dolce. Blue, like the sky I look on the back of Mommy's motor scooter. Green, like the walls of Don Felicio's house. Yellow, like that flower outside the warehouse. I think of Mama. I don't want to think of her. Until now, I've pushed her out of my mind each time she's come in. There's no more landscape to watch, and there's no sound of wind or tires or hissing of the bus. No television or people to distract me. There is only Mama. My eyes fill with tears that flow no matter how much I don't want them to. I don't want to think of her, back home, staring at the ceiling, thinking of me, wondering how I could leave her, how I could lie and tell her everything was okay. How I could hide so much from her. I don't want her wondering what kind of trouble I was in and how she could have protected me. I don't want her wondering if I'm okay now or where I'm sleeping tonight. I hear a cracking sound and wonder if it's my heart breaking. Maybe it's not made of muscle and chambers, ventricles and arteries. Maybe it's made of glass. Maybe those sharp pains in my chest are shards slicing me from the inside out. And maybe it can never be put back together again. I look up at La Virgin. I squeeze my eyes shut. Even if I'm not sure God will hear me, I pray. I pray like Chico, please, please keep us safe. The next morning, we sit outside for breakfast. The shelter is off a side street that's off a side street from the main road, so I can hear the muffled sound of traffic, of horns blaring and vendors selling, just like the surrounding trees, and just under the louder noise of the shelter, of pots and pans in the kitchen, of people waking up and conversing, of water running and the television blaring with morning cartoons and small kids giggling. <clears throat> a couple of guys approach us sitting nearby. Where are you guys headed? One of them asks. My heart races at the question. I remember Marlena's comments from yesterday about people at shelters who pretend to be migrants. But Chico, with his mouth full of eggs and beans, quickly answers. Ariga, he says, just as I say, al norte. I realize I forgot to tell him to stop answering questions when strangers ask. Ariaga, one of the guys says, to catch La Vista, you right? Us too. Are you leaving today? We can travel together. I've made the trip before. I know the way. Oh, wow, Chico explains. That would be... His voice stops, and I can see that Pequena has turned to him and blocked him from the guy's view. Really? The guy goes on. Last time I got caught crossing El Rio Bravo, but I mean, that was probably a good thing, because honestly, I almost drowned. He shakes his head and looks at me. He looks honest enough, but I can tell if he's being truthful. Can't tell if he was convincing enough for Marlena, but is really someone trying to lure us out of here? Lead us to who knows where. Maybe he's another wolf, just like Ray. I can't take the chance. No, nah, ma'am. We just got here, I tell him. We'll be here for a couple of days. The king is talking to Chico in a low voice, and when she moves out of the way, I see he avoids looking at me. We'll probably stick around that long, too, the guy says. Maybe we'll see each other on the other side one day. But I don't respond, and he gives me a funny look. I nod in turn, stare at my plate so he won't keep talking to us. The thing is, he can be perfectly harmless. I might have messed up bad because maybe he could have helped us out. But there's no way to know for sure. I try to imagine how the three of us look to others. Target. I keep eating, but the beans get stuck in my throat. It's hard to swallow past the fear that we've run into guys like Ray here already. The three of us stay quiet, and eventually the two guys finish their food and walk away. I turn to Chico. Don't tell anyone else what our plans are. Now we have to keep our eyes on those guys and make sure they aren't keeping their eyes on us. Sorry, he says, staring down at his feet. I shake my head, feeling bad because I made him feel bad, on top of all the worry of the trip. It's okay, Chico, Pequena says gently, but Paul goes right. We can only trust each other. It's fine, I muttered to Chico. Just put her up. Be careful, okay? He nods. But Kenya looks at me. When do you want to leave? Tonight. We'll catch one of those white minivans from here all the way to Ariaga. The trip is only a few hours, but it will take us a lot longer than that because there are checkpoints. We'll have to get off before checkpoints and walk through the fields, then make our way back to the highway, past the checkpoint, and catch another minivan. Chico looks worried. At night? I shrug. From what I've heard, the checkpoints are less active at night, and there are less of them, so we'll cover more distance faster. But Kenya nods. If we leave at 7 tonight, we'll have 12 hours of darkness to make the trip. After sunrise, there are more officials out, I continue. I look down at the food on my plate. My stomach's in knot, but I also know I need energy to make the trip. I think of what lies ahead of us. I think of the women who made us this food. And even though it falls like a heavy brick in my stomach, I eat it all. Chico and Pequena do the same. Father Gibelter suddenly enters out and begins talking to those of us who have gathered here. Marlena is handing out leaflets with information about other migrant shelters along the way. Numbers migrants can call for help, organizations that aid migrants, and in the same breath, reminds us to always be on guard and not be too trusting. 
warnings about the dangers along the way, and then a whole section on the dangers of riding La Bestia. We listen intently, and a sobering quiet comes over us when the father pleads for us to be vigilant and careful. I glance at Chico. He looks like he's going to throw up. I glance at Pequena. Her face is almost expressionless, but there is a kind of stoic anger building in her eyes. Padre Gibraltar tells us that we are standing next to those who will die along the way. People turn ever so slightly, looking at one another. And those of us who are lucky enough to survive will carry injuries and trauma that will last a lifetime. He lets that sink in for a long time, before reminding us to trust in God. Nothing is impossible for God. I thank all of the people who have passed through here, just like us, only to die hours or days later. The brick in my stomach grows heavier. Father Gabel tried to remind or praise over us, and then the crowd disper- and then the crowd disperses. Quiet of the father's words of sobering reality. We understand danger. We grew up with danger, but this danger feels different. This danger feels more crushing, but maybe because it's so close to where hope lives. Father Gibelja is right, but the problem is if we think about all that can go wrong, we won't go on. And if we don't think about it, we'll probably die. I try to push it out of my mind, for now. We'll shower before we leave, I tell Chico with Pequena. It'll probably be a while before we get another chance, and the fresher we look, the less attention we'll draw. When we go to Marlena to get our backpacks, she hands them over and shows us the long line of others waiting. There's only one shower, so it'll be a while. There's no hot water, and you have five minutes, but it's something. I nod. Thank you. We sit on the floor as we wait, moving up every few minutes as someone gets into the shower and then emerges back out into the hallway. If someone is taking too long, the next person bangs on the door. We move up and up and up. We are near the kitchen, where I can see another line of people. That line is for those who can afford to buy a calling card. One by one, they are handed a cell phone to borrow. I watch as a guy dials. He waits, and then I hear him say hello to whoever is on the other end of the line. Then he's telling them he made it to Mexico, that he's in his shelter, that he's okay. But each word comes out more choked than the one before. Then he is staring at the ceiling, tears streaming down his face. He stays like this a few minutes, trying to compose himself. He nods at whatever is being said to him, but he can't seem to get any more words out. I look at Pequena. Let's call them, I tell her. Let them know we're okay. She looks at me. We should, but she stares in the direction of the guy. He's hunched over now. Do you really want to? She asks. I know what she means. I know she thinks I will dissolve in a pool of my own tears if I hear Mama's voice. And she's so right. I think about it. I think of her voice, of the strangle in it as soon as she hears mine, of the way she'll want to crawl right through the phone to hold me, to pull me back to her, of the way I will have to hang up, not knowing if I'll ever hear her voice again. If we call, we won't go on. We won't be able to. And they'll convince us not to, Bikinia says. Before you know it, we'll be back in Puerto Barrios, back to the things that sent us running. I look down hoping she doesn't see the tears in my eyes just at the fault. Another person is on the phone now, more tears streaming down another face. Another person choking on his words, swallowing his pain. I hear my mother's voice in my mind again. That some part of me, inside, crumbles. We'll call more closer, she says. I nod, when, not if, because we'll make it, I tell myself. I look over at Chico playing cards with the little kids who are watching cartoons. They're laughing as he acts like a clown and makes silly faces at them. And even though somebody might get irritated because I'm saving his place in line, it's worth it just to see him being himself, even if only for a little while. That night, as seven o'clock approaches, my heart starts drumming faster. The beat picks up with each second that passes. I get my bag and make sure the Walkman is still there. Soon enough, I'll be on that train and able to listen to my father's tapes. I focus on that, that moment, my father. And I wonder if he'll be with me on that train, if his spirit is walking next to me, even now. I look at the clock. Five more minutes. I look at Pequena and Chico, who are both looking at that clock, too. Esta bien, abuela, I hear a girl say. It's the one old man who hobbled to the mural of the Virgin last night. He nods and smiles at her, trying to reassure her. They both have their bags and are headed to the front door. They must be going to catch one of the minibuses or vans also. A part of me wants to ask, but then I don't really want to know. I feel bad for the old man. Already, I'm worrying about him, about his granddaughter, and I don't have room for any more worry or ache in my heart than I already have. I see their silhouettes in the doorway, the evening light behind them. The old man is wearing a cowboy hat and a pair of sneakers I saw Marlena giving him earlier. He starts coughing so violently he has to stop walking, and then he's grabbing his chest, and then the young girl is screaming, just like that. People rush to him. Father Gibelto is on the ground next to him, yelling for someone to call an ambulance. The girl is screaming. She's screaming and screaming and screaming. She's begging him not to leave her. She is begging God not to let him die. She is begging everyone around her. 
And we are all standing there, unable to move, unable to do anything. And I think to her, we must look like we can't hear her. A woman goes to her knees, trying to hug the girl, trying to pull her away as the priest says the old man needs room. But she's holding on to her grandfather's hand so tight and she's screaming, We've come so far, Abuelito, please, please stay with me. I turn away from it. But before I do, I see her looking at me and I see a flash of desperation. Don't leave, she yells, her voice so shrill, so high. I don't know how God wouldn't be able to hear her. I know she means her grandfather. I know that's who she means. But the way she says it, the way she looks, I can hardly move. I'm sorry, I whisper, though it's impossible for her to hear me. And we go into that dusk, far away from her, far away from the dying. Pequena. Outside, we don't say a word. We hear the wail of an ambulance. Bulga looks around, his eyes intent and listening as he tries to figure out where we are and where we need to go. I know a part of him wants to cry. I know his heart is aching for that girl and her grandfather. Mine is too. We've come so far. Her scream was so primal, so scared. Even with the rush of voices of all those who hurried to help, voices yelling for someone to start CPR, yelling for someone to call an ambulance, for everyone else to stand back. Even with all those noises, it's her scream. And the way it reverberated through that shelter that I will always remember. I feel that scream inside me too. I think it's this way, Bulga says. The words bring me out from inside my head. He's reading his notes, looking down at the notepad I saw him scribbling in earlier as he stared at the maps on the wall in the shelter. Up ahead, there are more people who have left the shelter and are headed in the same direction, and more still who appear on that street, all of us looking lost. We walk faster, and a tangy, sour smell fills the air, mixed with the smell of roasting meat. The ambulance wails louder. It slides flash in the early dusk until it wails past us like some creature in pain, like the girl screaming back at the shelter. Maybe it's still her, I hear. I grip the straps and my backpack tighter. We turn down a street. Muchachos! A woman with a small child heading down the same road as us gestures, trying to get our attention. Is this the way to the highway? She asks. She has a backpack. The little girl has one, too, with a unicorn stuffed animal peeking its head out of the zipper. Bulga glances in the woman's direction and gives just a quick nod. Chica looks at the little girl and gives her a smile and a little wave. She waves back shyly. I think so, I tell her. Oh, good, she says, sighing in relief. I wasn't sure, but I saw a lot of people with backpacks walking this way, so she struggles to walk fast and talk to keep pace with us. But Polka has sped up and is walking so fast now, it's hard for me and Chico to keep up. Within minutes, there's the good amount of distance between us and the woman. I look back and see a look of defeat on her face as she pulls her little girl along with her. Chico looks at me and then at Polka. Why'd you do that? Chico mumbles. Do what? Polka says, scratching his head and looking irritated. Leave them behind like that. She was just asking, and I answered, he says. Yeah, but but what? Polka says, moving even faster now, keeping his gaze ahead. He doesn't bother to look back at even me or Chico as we struggle to keep up. We have to jog to match his face. You want them to ride the buses with us, too? You want to know what happens to that little girl, Chico, to her mother? You want to be around when one of them drops dead like the old man back there? Or worse? We don't say anything. We pretend not to notice when Polka wipes his eyes quickly. Bulga's words hit me like little knives. He's right, I tell Chico. Chico looks at me and then shakes his head. We shouldn't be like that, though. I know, I tell Chico. He's right, too. The streets smell like urine. The stickiness of that night and the blood still draining from my body made me feel like I haven't showered in days. My jacket is bulky and hot, but I keep it on. I think the old man back at the shelter had been behind me in line for the shower, so I overheard when Marlena gave him a pair of sneakers to replace the ones that had fallen apart on his journey from Honduras. We've come so far. He smiled and thanked her and showed me his shoes proudly. These will take me all the way to Los Estados Unidos, he said, looking at the sneakers like they were magical. He and his granddaughter were headed out tonight, just like us. He'd showered and gotten ready for death. I looked down at my own sneakers, dirty and old. I wonder if they will take me all the way to the States, or if I'll end up like the old man, dead before he even set foot out the door. And his granddaughter. What will happen to her? Will she be sent back home? Back to whatever it was that she was so desperate to escape? I force myself to stop running all the scenarios in my head to leave the thought of them behind no matter how terrible it makes me feel. Just keep walking. Soon, the crunching of gravel underfoot gives way to a louder rushing sound. We're near a highway, I think. Cars are passing us by, some beeping and some people shouting out to us every now and then. Why are they yelling at us like that? I ask Bulga. His eyes are looking everywhere. Some don't want us here, Bulga says, shrugging. We're to Mexico, what Mexico is to the state. We walk along the stretch of the road for a while before finally one of the minibuses pulls up right ahead. Bulga starts running and we follow. He has the money ready for the three of us, separated from the rest of his money this time. He takes a seat right behind the driver and we squeeze in next to him. More people get in. Rapido, 
or just the driver. The line of people moves faster, paying the fare and trying to settle down quickly. The van takes off before everyone has even found a seat. We stare out the road, cars passing us by, minibuses and vans, people still on the side of the road, walking, trying to catch a ride. Perdon, uh, how long before the first checkpoint, Volga asked. Depends, the driver said. They move around. Sometimes you only ride 10 minutes and suddenly a checkpoint has popped up. The driver keeps his eyes on the road, has a phone on his dashboard. Let us know, ma'am, as soon as you see a checkpoint. Relax, relax, the driver tells Polka. It's not good for you if you get caught and busted, but it's not good for me either. I need to make a living. Don't worry. I'll let you know. He turns on Nortina music and plays it loudly. But Polka sits upright in his seat, looking out the front window like an eagle. I keep my eyes on the side of the road, dark and thick with trees. A flash of a girl with a unicorn in her backpack punches into my mind, and I imagine her walking tonight in all that thick darkness. A lump forms in my throat, a heaviness in my chest. She looked tired and her eyes seemed sad even as her mouth smiled. I'm glad Polga wouldn't let us wait up. I'm glad she's not in this minibus. I don't want to know her fate. Up ahead, there are red taillights as traffic slows down. My body tenses up. The loud music feels strange. The horns and accordion blasting in the minibus as we sit here like springs ready to burst. I look at the time lit up on the dashboard as minutes tick by. Too much time passes while we're stuck. I'm moving. Suddenly, the driver's phone flashes. He looks down and immediately makes his way to the far right lane of the highway. A car horn blares. This is it. Get out. Que Dios, let's guard. The driver yells as he turns down the music. Get out. Get out. The door opens and there's a rush as everyone gathers their things, calls to one another in a hurry, and we spill into the side of the highway. I catch a quick glimpse of a woman running with a rosary in her hands before she gets lost in the trees and heavy brush. Chico, pequeña, Polka calls. I grab Chico's hand and pull him along, trying not to lose sight of Polga as he makes his way into that forest. He turns, searching for us, but keeps running toward the field. We're here. I catch up and grab onto his shirt. We run, grass crunching under our feet, stumbling over tree roots, not stopping even as branches smack our faces and bushes and leaves brush against our clothes. My abdomen is clenching, my heart pounding. My backpack swings from side to side with the heaviness of the water bottles we took from the shelter. Chico clutches my sweaty hand harder as it begins to slip from his grip. Don't worry, Chiquito, I manage to say. I won't leave you. These little sounds escape him, terrible sounds, like those of a hurt or scared animal, and it puts me even more on edge. I hold his hand tighter. Don't worry, I say as we dodge through trees. Volga is ahead of us, and he runs so fast, like a mountain goat, over the uneven terrain. It's impossible to keep up with him as he yells, hurry, hurry, but we run faster under that darkness, into that darkness, into someone who will want to rob us, or authorities who are already waiting out here, knowing that drivers drop migrants off before checkpoints, or worse, narcos who will kidnap and hold us until they get money from our families my insides feel like they will fall out of me with <clears throat> my insides my insides feel like they will fall out of me at any moment with each hard thump of my feet on the ground for a terrible moment i think i can't my body can't do this right now but then i remember what my body has already done what it has been through what it will go through if i don't run fear and adrenaline rush through me so i run i keep going until finally polga slows down we ease up the pace until we are jogging. Stop, she goes, says, stop, just for a minute. We slow down to a stop, finally, and she goes, falls to the ground. We gotta keep moving, Bulga manages, but he's bent over now, trying to catch his breath. I fall next to Chico, and we all stay quiet for a minute. Chico starts coughing, trying to catch his breath, and then his coughing turns to crying. My body's buzzing, buzzing. My scalp is itching. I feel like I'm made up of a million buzzing bees, and tears are stringing my eyes. It's okay, Bulga whispers. It's because it's the first jump, that's all. It'll get easier. But his voice is high. It's unnatural. It's scared. Yeah, Chico whimpers. We'll be okay, I say, putting my arm around Chico. And when we are finally able to catch our breath and swallow our fears, stand up again, my legs tremble. I don't know if it's from fear or adrenaline. Okay, okay, Bulga says, taking deep breaths. Listen, we're going to walk out here for about two hours. We walk out and up northeast imagine an arc in your mind and it will take us around the checkpoint that's what we're doing there are a lot of trees and cover here but we'll walk that long just to be safe i think that will be enough our feet crunch through the brush and my eyes try to adjust to that infinite darkness the moon seems non-existent though i catch the faintest sliver of it through the trees every few minutes out and up for an hour then back toward the highway for another bulga says as we walk I hold out my hand and grab onto his backpack because I can hardly see him. I take Chico's hand and have him hold onto my backpack. We have to be quiet, though, Bulga whispers again. Then we'll catch another minibus, see how far it takes us. Before we have to run out like this again, Chico says. Yeah, Polga answers. How many times, I ask. 
I can't tell if the slickness between my legs is blood or sweat or my insides. I tell myself I layered enough pads. Everything will be okay. My body can do this. I hope I'm right. I don't know, Polka says, however many checkpoints there are. His voice is so quiet. And then we all walk in silence, holding on to one another. The night is quiet, too, disturbed only by the sound of our rustling. And every now and then, the rustle of something farther away. Maybe just an animal or maybe others who were in the van. Or maybe those who were already out there before we came. We don't see anyone else, but we feel the fear, palpable in the air. As if the trees and bu- bush, as if the trees and bushes themselves have absorbed the weight of this journey from everyone who has ever roamed through. And with each step, it feels like we're deeper and deeper into some kind of dark maze, some labyrinth or trap that we might never find our way out of.